Basset, not the reset, it was Basset, with the infinities in higher, not the solar, higher order calculations. Then in 1947 to 1950, when I was a graduate student and young postdoc, there was the revolution called the renormalization. Renormalization was a recipe, uh, not really a theory, which was extremely successful. The latest uh, theoretical and experimental agreement showed that uh, the extra magnetic moment of the electron, A equal to G minus two divided by two, has been measured experimentally and calculated uh, theoretically by renormalization. And the two agree to one part in a billion. That is a spectacular success. It is uh, mysterious how such a makeshift uh, program called uh, renormalization could be so very, very accurate. It's a mystery which uh, perhaps in future years uh, will be understood uh, better than we do today. <coughs> With the success of uh, renormalization, during the 20 years between 1950 and 1970, there were, of course, naturally, efforts to extend the field theory. Uh, there were also efforts to find alternatives to field theory. Because uh, although renormalization was successful, it was recognized that it was not enough to uh, to describe the new phenomena, especially the new particles that have been discovered experimentally. Finally, in the 1970s, uh, physicists returned to field theory, to non-abelian gauge theory. Now, gauge theory did not originate at that time. It had originated earlier in 1919 from the work of the great mathematician Hermann Weyer, who wrote in 1919, the fundamental conception on which the development of Riemann's geometry must be based, if it is to be in agreement with nature, is that of the infinitesimal parallel displacement of a vector. If an infinitesimal displacement of a vector, its direction keeps changing. That is what was necessary in Riemannian geometry and in general relativity. Then, Bayer asked, warum nicht auch seine Länge? Why not also its length? If its direction can change, uh, why not? its length can change. So therefore, he figured out a theory in which the length measurement keeps on changing with uh, the, the parallel displacement of a vector. Based on this idea, Bayer introduced a Strecken fractal, or proportionality factor, which is written in this formula, in which gamma is a, a real number. In other words, he identified the infinitesimal length changing factor with the vector potential at that particular point. Einstein criticized this early idea of a virus. Uh, then in 1925 to 1926, Falk and London independently pointed out that in quantum mechanics, P minus EA, EA becomes this expression when you replace P 
by a differential operator. They compared this formula with the Hermann virus uh, uh, proportionality factor and uh, realized that the Hermann virus gamma should be imaginary in quantum mechanics instead of a uh, virus proposal that gamma in real. In 1929, Weyer bought this idea of uh, Falk and of London and published an important paper accepting that gamma should be imaginary. Once that is accepted, Bayer arrived at two things. A, a precise definition in quantum mechanics of gauge transformation, both for electromagnetic field and for wave function of the charged particles. It's a coupled transformation. On the one hand, it uh, gives a electromagnetic gauge transformation, and on the other hand, it changes the phase of uh, charged particles in quantum mechanics. Second, he found, Weyer found, that Maxwell equations are invariant uh, under this uh, combined gauge transformations. So this is the first clear formulation of uh, uh, what is known as a gauge transformation. Bayer's gauge invariance produced no new experimental result. It was very pretty, but uh, it produced no experimental results. <laughs> So it was regarded as an elegant formalism, but not essential. I remember when I was a uh, graduate student and later a young postdoc, uh, we all knew about uh, the gauge transformation. And uh, mathematically, it's very elegant, but uh, there was no use. The only practical use I remember was um, you wait when a colleague gives a lecture. At the end, you would uh, shoot the following question uh, at him. Is your result a gauge invariant? <laughs> if uh, he had thought about it, he would give you a good answer. If he had not uh, thought about it, it would floor him. After World War II, many new strange particles were found. How do they interact with each other? This was the dominant question when I was a graduate student between 1946 and 1948. This question led to a generalization of virus gauge generators to a possible new theory of interaction beyond the electromagnetism. This was a born non abelian gauge theory. Motivation for this generalization was concisely stated in a 1954 abstract. The electric charge serves as a source of the electromagnetic field. An important concept in this case is gauge invariance, which is closely connected with one, the equation motion of the electromagnetic field, two, the existence of a current density, and three, the possible interactions between a charged field and the electromagnetic field. We have tried to generalize this concept of gauge invariance to apply to isotopic spin conservation. Isotopic spin conservation was a concept which originated already in the 1930s from the papers of Heisenberg and especially of Wigner. By the late 1940s, isotopic spin conservation was well established. So there was a additional conservation law in addition to electric charge conservation. If electric charge through gauge invariance 
can generate an electromagnetic field, wouldn't this uh, isotopic string, conserved isotopic, isotopic string, also generate a field? And that is the motivation for uh, that paper. And the result was what is now called a non-abelian gauge theory. Non-abelian gauge theory was very beautiful but was not embraced by the physicist, physics community for many years because it seemed to require the existence of massless charged particles. In fact, uh, I had uh, published uh, in one of my uh, books a description of uh, what happened in 1954 when I uh, gave a talk at the Institute for Advanced Study about uh, the work that the Mills and I were doing on the non-abelian gauge theory. And uh, Pauli was in the audience, and he gave me a very hard time. <laughs> uh, the reason that uh, he was not believing in the non-abelian gauge theory was because he believed that uh, the theory apparently would lead to massless charged particles, which was of course, uh, both theoretically nonsensical and experimentally not confirmable. Therefore, non-abelian gauge theory throughout the 50s and 60s was considered another beautiful idea, but uh, had nothing to do with the reality. Then starting in the 1960s, the concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking was introduced, which eventually led to a series of major advances, finally to a U1 cross SU2 cross SU3 gauge theory of electroweak interactions and strong interactions, now called the standard model. In the 40-some years since 1970, the international theoretical and experimental physics community worked, working in particles and fields combined their efforts in the development and the verification of this model with spectacular success, climaxing in the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012 by two large experimental groups at CERN, each consisting of several thousand physicists. comment. Dis despite its spectacular success, most physicists believe the standard model is not the final story. One of its chief ingredients, the symmetry breaking mechanism, is a phenomenological construct which in many respects is similar to the four ply interaction in Fermi's beta decay theory of the 1930s. That theory was also very successful for almost 40 years after 1933, but it was finally replaced by the deeper U1 cross SU2 electroweak theory. Entirely independent of developments in physics, there emerged during the first half of the 20th century a mathematical theory called the fiber bundle theory which had diverse conceptual origins. Differential forms of Ely Carton, statistics of hoteling, topology of uh, Whitney, and so forth. Global differential geometry by Chern, connection theory by Arismond, etc., etc. The great diversity of its mathematical conceptual origin indicates that the fiber bundle is a central mathematical construct. It came as a great shock to both physicists and mathematicians when it became clear in the 1970s that the mathematics of gauge theory, both abelian and non-abelian, is exactly the same as that of fiber bundle theory. But it was a welcome shock as it served to bring back the close relationship 
between the two disciplines, which had been interrupted through the increasingly abstract nature of mathematics since the middle of the 20th century. Comment. In 1975, after learning the rudiments of a fiber bundle theory from my mathematician colleague, Jim Simons, I showed him the 1931 paper by Dirac on the magnetic monopole. After he digested Dirac's paper, he exclaimed, Dirac had discovered trivial and non-trivial bundles before mathematicians. Ordinary electromagnetism uses mathematics of a trivial bundle. Mag electromagnetism with magnetic monopoles uh, uses fiber bundle theory, which is non-trivial. That is the end of my talk, but it's not the end of this line of development. It is clear that uh, new fundamental ideas, uh, both mathematical and uh, physical, are required to make further progress, uh, in particular to eliminate the phenomenological nature of the mechanism for uh, symmetry break. Thank you. So, questions? But then there is a very important step to say, now let's take the Schrodinger equation plus the concept of local U1 abelian gauge invariance, and we can get Maxwell equations from the gauge principle in quantum mechanics. Which name would you associate it with that? Or is this conceptual step also, was it first advanced in, in your work together with uh, Professor Mills? pointed out that uh, Maxwell's theory is invariant under gauge transformations. Uh, in fact, uh, when Maxwell wrote down his equations, uh, he already clearly uh, sensed there is a, there is a fourfold symmetry but uh, he did not uh, explicitly formulate it. It was uh, Einstein and Minkowski who discovered the rotation the symmetry or the Lorentz symmetry of uh, the electromagnetism. The second important 
invariance of the electron magnetism was discovered by Hermann Mayer through the gauge invariance. Today, uh, these two invariances together, in some sense, uh, required the structure of Maxwell equations. You might even say that the Maxwell equation it follows directly from both requirements. Yeah, exactly, that is my question. So you say Weil also understood that. Weil understood that you can derive Maxwell theory from the gauge principle. Understood it, uh, and uh, but uh, it did not produce new results. So therefore, as I said, it was regarded as elegant but use useless. Mm -hmm. Then came the new particles, and uh, I, as a graduate student, realized that with all these new particles, if you want to know how they interact, you need some new principle. At that time, many people were working on this. For example, there were many papers published in the 1940s, late 1940s, of a vector meson with a vector interaction, pseudo-scalar meson with pseudo-vector interaction. Books and books were written about this. So, these one of the symmetries, namely the Lorentz symmetry, to invent the interaction between these new particles. I thought that is not enough. One needs uh, some new principle. And where would one get this new principle? From gauge invariance. So if you generalize gauge invariance to a more general uh, gauge invariance, you can have a new principle. That is what is stated explicitly in that uh, abstract that I just re read to you. And uh, that was mathematically very beautiful, but as I said, it immediately was set with the problem of uh, what about the massless uh, charged particles, which was discussed in the last paragraph of the paper that Mills and I published. If you read that the last paragraph, you realize that we stated that this is something that we do not understand. And uh, we have uh, tried to resolve it, but without successful. Without saying it, the implication was that uh, this requires additional studies. That additional studies turns out to have come some 10 years later in the idea of symmetry breaking, which uh, arose from the minds of several people. And then uh, Hicks materialized that uh, idea into one particular model, and that is uh, the Hicks model. And uh, nobody at that time, in the 1960s, when Hicks published his paper, and when other pe people published similar papers, had the idea that uh, it was the right one. Because it was uh, ad hoc. It was uh, only one possibility. And uh, gradually, physicists collectively were amazed that somehow it agrees with the experiment when you adjust the parameters. And that is the status of the present understanding of the uh, standard model. Thank you very much. If I still may, very brief comment, as long as I have the microphone. In spirit, your lecture reminds me of a wonderful talk I heard at Leiden University by Vladimir Arnold, the Russian mathematician who does geometry of mathematical systems. And that talk was rereading Newton's Principia 200 years later. And he talked about how deep the thinking was in Newton's original writing and how you could find new mathematical theorems there. 
There is also an essay by Arnold. Are you aware of that work? Because I think it would be very interesting and similar in spirit. realization of the concept of a fiber bundle here. Uh, fiber bundle became really uh, understood as a fundamental mathematical concept by the mathematicians in the 19, perhaps in the 1950s. If the mathematicians and that, that development of the fiber bundle theory was completely independent of physics. If that discovery had been made before 1929, before Byers' 1929 paper, because Byers was a great mathematician, if he had known about the fiber bundle idea, before 1929, with his uh, knowledge and interest in group theory, it would be very natural for him to generalize a gauge invariance to non-abelian gauge invariance. It would be the most natural thing because uh, he was hooked on the idea of gauge invariance. He was uh, also one of the greatest experts uh, in Lee groups. So these two of his uh, obsessions, uh, he would have combined them together if he had known that the electromagnetism is a gauge theory, is a fiber bundle theory. But somehow, uh, fiber bundle theory was not developed or was not, did not mature yet. So it was uh, only in the 1970s that uh, the mathematics of uh, gauge theory, both abelian and non abelian became identified with the mathematics of a fiber bundle theory. So uh, history is very interesting in the time lag between mathematical concepts and the physics concepts. Uh, in the previous back to uh, Century Breaking and the Higgs field. Uh, throughout your talk, uh, it is about the uh, infinitesimal vector displacement, displacement of vector field. But with the Higgs, uh, we have experimentally, we're seeing a scalar. So, and it brings in at least uh, apparently non gauge forces. Do you have an opinion on that? is not intrinsic to gauge theory. It is added to make symmetry breaking uh, possible in gauge theories. And that is, uh, as I said, uh, miraculously in agreement with the experiment in so many different uh, directions, and yet it's clearly unsatisfactory. And I think uh, my example was a good one. This is very similar to Fermi's beta decay theory. Fermi's